So, uh, I was thinking about now that we were done with Ruth, we're going to talk about this week. And uh, I got to thinking about the idea of taking a break, you know, taking some rest. And when I, uh, when I started thinking about this idea of take a break, I couldn't get a jingle out of my head. Maybe you remember back in the, uh, back in the 90s, the, uh, the Kit Kat commercial, give me a break, give me a break. That's all I could think about. And so with that in mind, I actually dove back into the early 50s. And Gabriel, I'll ask you to play that first one if you wouldn't mind. I'll get started with a I couple of things. Kit Kat Fred. That's right, milk chocolate crisp center. Kit Kat being what it is and me being what I am, we seem to come together quite natural this time of the morning. I always say... Have a break. Have a Kit Kat. That was the earlier slogan. But I like that, have a break. Have a Kit Kat. My second one jumps over to the Snickers side from the mid-90s. Uh, and this was actually one of my favorite commercials during the Super Bowl in, uh, I can't remember, it was 95, 96, somewhere in there. Gabriel, go ahead and play the next one. Hey, that's great. But who are the chefs? Not going anywhere for a while? Great googly moogly. Grab a Snickers. You spell it. Yeah. That was one of my favorites. And in that same vein, I have one more. I, I, you know, church goes in threes or sevens or forties, and I figured seven and forty was a bit much, but I do have a third. Gabriel, go ahead and play the last one. <laughs> You okay? I'm fine. Let's go. No, hold on. Where are you? I'm in New York. Who am I? Hey, coach. And who are you? I'm Batman. Sit down. You don't understand. I'm Batman. I do. I do. Not going anywhere for a while? Grab a Snickers. Hello, good citizen. My name is Batman. You could be my assistant. Would you like that? Would you like to ride with Batman? So all three of these have a common theme, though. It's the idea of taking a, just stepping back and stopping for a minute and taking a break, right? That seemed to be the advertising concept for decades for a candy bar, right? Take a break from what you're doing, have a snack. But the idea of a break is really about the stopping part, right? Stopping what you're doing. And I think if we were to stop and think about it, we could probably all use a little rest, couldn't we? Anyone here have a hectic life? I hear a few chuckles, right? Work, kids, grandkids, stuff going on. We, are, we as Americans are often defined by our full schedules. We are not good at stopping for rest. But what would it look like if we took a pause for just a moment, if we hit the pause button on our hectic lives, and actually thought about what rest really means. I'm not talking about dropping into bed exhausted in the evening. Any of you wake up in the morning still feeling tired from the night before? I get that a lot. How many of you got rest this last summer? I know COVID kind of threw things into kind of a mess. It changed a lot of our plans. You know, I'm not talking about the rest that came from stay-at-home orders that enforced, you know, things are closed, don't go out. How many of you actually, though, find time each year for rest, true rest? Jennifer and I this year got away on a couple of camping trips. That was the extent of our getting away. But even if it had been a full year and we would have taken a full trip, it doesn't always equate to a restful time. How many of you equate vacation with rest? How many of you equate vacation with a need for rest when it's over? That's often how I feel. When I, when I come back from a trip, we, we have a limited amount of time. We have, uh, you know, it's not something that we get to do a lot. And so we load it down with all kinds of activities and we make sure it's full. Not this last summer, summer before, we went to Disneyland. We spent two weeks on the road. 
and every day was packed full of something. Five days of blowing my step count out of the water because, uh, I mean, what, what did we, we tracked in, uh, I don't know, a dozen miles in a single day just from walking around the park. And when we were done, it was traveling from point to point to point and going and seeing stuff and doing stuff. And I think a lot of us experience this. You know, we go into something thinking that we're going to find rest, that we're going to have a break, but we don't find what we're looking for. Americans are the most stressed out, burnt out, busy, exhausted, overworked, run ragged people that have ever inhabited the planet Earth. Just ask a parent who has children who play sports. Right? You know about this. We live in an always-on, non-stop culture that moves constantly, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We have, even have cities that take pride in their non-stop status. Right? What's the nickname for San Francisco? It's a city that never sleeps. Actually, it's a nickname for Vegas, too. Right? It's always on. New York. New York. We don't know how to slow down or how to stop. In 2017, Americans lost $62.2 billion in unused paid time off. That is lost time. That was forfeited vacation. $62.2 billion in lost time off. 212 million hours forfeited vacation time. 24% of Americans said they hadn't taken off any paid time, any at all, in more than a year. This is crazy. We need a break, and we know we need one, but then we don't, we don't take it, and as a matter of fact, we brag about it. Have you ever heard someone brag about how many hours they work? I have. I'm really proud of the fact that I worked 75 hours last week. This is the culture we live in. We prize overwork. Back in 1992, the, the country band Alabama released a song with the lyrics. Anybody know that you start singing along? It's welcome. I'm in a hurry to get things done. Oh, I rush and rush until life's no fun. All I really got to do is live and die, but I'm in a hurry and I don't know why. I rush and I rush until life's no fun. This is what not taking a break is all about. How are you feeling right now? I think we need to ask this question. When was the last time we felt truly rested? When was the last time we took a break? Well, guess what? We're in church and Jesus has good news for you. Jesus is the one who offers us that real rest that we're looking for. Not just waking up in the morning and not feeling exhausted, but true rest. Rest that goes deeper than the surface level of physical activity, but gets to our souls. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus, uh, Jesus is say, speaking uh, to his disciples. He's speaking to the crowd. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my burden upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Any of you ever read that verse before? Like, I got a different version of it. Gabriel, put the next one, because I like how Eugene Peterson puts that exact same verse in the message. He says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Take a moment and think about those words. Unforced rhythms of grace. If you're worn out, feeling burned out on life? Jesus has good news. He offers the way to recover that life. But we need to do more than just knowing that it's possible. There needs to be more than just knowing that it's available. We need to know how. And that's what I want to help you with this morning. As we talk about rest, how do we go about receiving that, that lighter burden that Jesus offers? How do we enter into or, or experience those unforced rhythms of grace? I think a lot of times we approach the Bible as if it's magic. 
If we just read it and know it, then somehow we'll receive it. We think reading equals getting. So we read about rest and we think we're going to get it because we know it's there. But when we read this invitation from Jesus carefully, and that's what this is. This is an invitation. We see that there is something that we have to do. Jesus says, come to me. He says, walk with me. Learn from me. Take from me. This is an interactive relationship that we have. There are things that we have to do. Now, let me be clear. This is not talking about salvation. This is not something that we have to do to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? I'm not talking about this. This is something we have to do to find rest. This is not on the finding Jesus side of things. This is on the following Jesus. When we follow Jesus, we have to put some effort in. It takes some of ourselves. Effort is not the enemy of grace. Earning is the enemy of grace. When we talk about earning something, now we've strayed into a dangerous place. But when we are following Jesus, it takes some effort on our part to participate in what God has for us. If we don't seek the rest he has for us, we won't receive it. Time and time again, the Bible talks about following, receiving, taking, seeking, finding, looking. All those are... All those require us to participate. The truth is, though, for many of us, and I'm very much at the top of this list, uh, for many of us, we are not following Jesus into rest. See, there's something Jesus did every, uh, every week of his life, something that we're not good at doing. You know what it was? Jesus kept the Sabbath. From sundown Friday until sundown Saturday, all work stopped and people took a day to rest in God. Now, this isn't to say that there aren't other ways to find rest, but I can't come up with one other way to live into a rhythm of rest, an unforced rhythm of grace, to participate with God in rest. There's nothing else in there other than taking the Sabbath. I think the practice of Sabbath is something that we have forgotten and something that we would do well to rediscover and reclaim in our culture. One day when we make a serious commitment to rest. I think often we think about Sabbath, we think about the day we go to church. We think about those two hours or so that we set aside for getting there, being at church, and getting home. But if we look at the practice of Sabbath in the Bible, we discover that God intended it really to be something different. It is intended to be a day when we set aside the distractions and the tasks and the chores and the projects of the week and we rest in the Lord. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like to direct your attention to Genesis chapter 2. At the very end of the account of creation, God has spent six days creating, doing his work, making the heavens and the earth, creating everything that inhabits it. And we get to Genesis chapter 2, and in verse 1 it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all of the work of creating that he had done. There is a not-so-subtle theme in this passage. Did you catch it? By the seventh day, God has finished, and on the seventh day, he rested. He made it holy because he rested from all that he had done. I think God's trying to tell us something. God finished his work, and he rested. No, he didn't do it because he was exhausted, right? God didn't come home, tired and sore, kick off his boots, and flop on the couch. The Hebrew word for rested is the word Shabbat. This is where we get the word Sabbath. And in Hebrew, this word means stop. So when we read that God, Shabbat, we translate it as rested and we think, oh, I'm exhausted, I need to sit back in the recliner and take it easy and regain my strength. But instead, what it's saying is on the seventh day, God stopped. God didn't rest because he was tired, he rested, he stopped because he wanted to take time to delight in what he had done. In creation, God declares over and over that the work is good. And so he takes time to stop and delight in the work. And in doing this, he's given creation 
all of us a gift, a time to stop and delight in God, in his goodness and grace, to just take time and enjoy him. And how do we know that this is an invitation for us to participate in? Because he declares this day to be holy. He creates, he does all this amazing work, and he, he says that it's good, and he gets to humanity, and he says it's very good. But when he gets to the Sabbath, he declares the Sabbath to be holy. Creation was good, but the Sabbath, the Shabbat, was set apart. That's what holy means, set apart, special. He made stopping a part of the rhythm of his creation. Six days to go, go, go. And one day to stop. In the Sabbath, God is inviting us to partake in his holy rest. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus is speaking and he says, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That's an interesting statement. Why does he say the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath? Sabbath was not the pinnacle of God's creation. Okay? We weren't created so there would be something to happen on the Sabbath. God created this day instead for us. It's for our good so that we could rest, so that we could just spend time relaxing in his presence. And you know what's neat about the creation story? Think about this for a moment. The very first day that Adam and Eve experience after their creation, what day is that? Anybody remember what day humanity was created on? Day six? And day seven is the Sabbath. The very first day that they got to experience following their creation is the day of rest. Their lives started with it. Sabbath is not something that we get to exhausted and beat up so that we just drop into it from exhaustion. Instead, Sabbath is the thing that we start from. We work from our rest, not towards rest. Life begins in rest, not in work. As a culture, we have it all backwards. Walter Brueggemann, uh, in his book, Sabbath is Resistance, says, Sabbath is the practice of letting life rest safely in God's hands. Maybe this is why we have such a hard time of it. Because it's about taking our hands off of our own lives and giving them over to God. It's an act of dependence and trust. It's a reminder that the universe can get along without us for one day. The universe can manage that our worth rests not in our work, but in our relationship with God. That's where our worth rests. It's not in what we produce. Our culture, our nation, our society would say that the more you produce, the better you produce, the the grander your vision, the grander the works of your hands, the more valuable you are. We tend to value people who make a lot of money in our culture. Have you noticed that? We tend to venerate or hold as somehow maybe knowing more than us normal people, those who have success or fame. But it's not our works that determine our worth. It's our relationship, our identity in Christ. Maybe this is why, though, we object to truly living out Sabbath, because we have a hard time taking our hands off. I know when I think about a day of rest, you know where mind immediate, my mind immediately goes? It goes to all the reasons why I can't do it. All the reasons why it's impractical, why my schedule won't allow it. You know, the kids aren't going to let me rest. I've just got too much to do. And then I have to laugh at the absurdity of what I just said, because the Holy Spirit pokes me and says, oh, Really? You have too much to do. You just can't fit God into your plans. I think this is why creation starts with rest. God created humanity start from rest because we start with God. We don't finish with whatever is left over to give to him. Sabbath is a weekly reminder that we are not Lord of our own lives. It's a reminder that we need to let go and we need to let God. Our life is found in God, and one of the places we find God is in the Sabbath. So I want to look at one more passage this morning that will hopefully help us understand then how we can incorporate this intentional rest into our lives. In Exodus chapter 20, Moses is setting down the law. These are the Ten Commandments. He's giving to the people of Israel God's law that he brought down from Mount Sinai. And in, uh, in verse 8, anybody remember the Sabbath, uh, what, what commandment that is? 
Am I putting you on the spot? I know I always have a hard time with that too. The fourth commandment is in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. And it says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Remember the Sabbath day by setting it apart. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Now this was a law for the nation of Israel. It has kind of a different place in their culture and in their life. In fact, you could be killed for not keeping the law. We're not in the same place. We are not going to be killed for failing to keep the Sabbath. We're just going to be really exhausted people. Israel had trouble upholding the law. He broke it frequently. Jesus came and he fulfilled the law. And what that means is we find all aspects of the law in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We approach the Sabbath with freedom. It's no longer a have to, but it's a get to. We get to experience the Sabbath. We get to find our rest. Not in a particular day of the week, but in in the person of Jesus and spending time with him. This means the Sabbath isn't locked into, uh, isn't locked into, you go, look, I've got to work on Sunday. That's okay. Okay. The key to finding Sabbath rest in our relationship with Jesus is just finding that time. The law brings wisdom. And there are two words in that passage that I think help us remember this, er, help us to incorporate the Sabbath into our lives. And they're the words remember and keep. Remember and keep. The first thing we need to do is we need to remember the Sabbath. We need to actually remember that it exists. Walter Brueggemann, again, he says, prosperity breeds amnesia. And I love that word, because what he means by this is that when things are prosperous and comfortable, when things are clicking your way, when you're busy, life is full, guess what you think about? That you got it all under control. That you are sufficient to manage your own life and your own needs. That the Sabbath isn't really necessary. But practicing Sabbath helps cure that amnesia. We take one day to intentionally give ourselves over to God, to remember that he is the one who is Lord of our lives. But it isn't going to happen by accident. To to remember the Sabbath, we need to schedule it in. We need to schedule it in. We just need to sit down. We need to look at our calendars and go, where can I put the Sabbath in? Maybe it is this day. Maybe it's coming and spending time in God's presence today. And then it's going home and saying, I'm going to intentionally at least take part of the rest of the day, put the to-do list to the side, and find a way to rest. And I'm not saying, go home, sit on the couch, and meditate on Jesus. But I'm saying, find something that fills you up, that you can practice for the glory of the Lord. Maybe you like to go out in the country and ride a bicycle. That's not going home and cutting the grass. One is a chore. The other is relaxing, restful. It's finding a way to schedule that time in and and just make a place where you're not doing the things you have to do, but you're doing the things you want to do. And you relate that to Jesus Christ. Take baby steps. We also need to prepare for the Sabbath. We need to get ready for it. In Jesus' culture, Sabbath was prepared for. All the work was done on Friday leading up to sundown. All the cooking, all the cleaning, all the preparation. The tables had to be set. The candles had to be there, prepared to be lit for the celebration of the Sabbath. This wasn't about being legalistic and saying, you can't work on the Sabbath. The goal, though, was to take all of those things away so that you could spend that time in the presence of the Lord. The second thing, remember the Sabbath, the other one is keep the Sabbath. So not only do we have to remember it, but we actually have to do it, right? We actually have to do it. How you set it apart, it may look different for, each, if the, for you than the person next to you. But here's the point. Keeping it holy is about setting it apart and focusing on the rest. Whatever you do, it begins with Shabbat. It begins with a stop. It begins with hitting the pause. It begins with taking a break, like the Kit Kat commercial. 
and saying, I'm in the middle of everything hectic in my life, I'm going to hit the pause button. Now, I know this isn't going to be easy. If you're like me, the list of reasons why it's impractical is running through your head. But think for just a minute. Is it wise to disregard something that God has created for your good? God says, remember the Sabbath. He says, keep it holy, set it apart. If we can't find time to Sabbath, isn't that saying we can't find time for God? If we can't find some time to let him be the focus of our day. Life is busy enough, and it isn't going to become uh, less busy. It isn't going to be any different unless we're willing to take a little action and make it different. We are tired. We are stressed. We are overscheduled and overworked. But God has given us time to rest. We just need to take it, don't you think? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. and I will give you rest. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I give thanks for the rest that you offer. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand it, to take it, to receive the gift that you have given us in some form. Lord, help us to recognize that it's okay, that it may look different than other people around us, but help us come to grips with the idea that in one way or another, we need to take that time. Help us to spend time with you finding the rest that truly restores us Uh, restores our energy, helps us to find our lives, help us to enter into those rhythms of unforced grace. Fill us with your presence this morning as we go out. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.